All right. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Hopefully everyone can hear me and can see the screen. It's 12.05, so I'm going to get us started. Um, I will not be able to monitor the chat. Um, so if you have any questions or want to interrupt me at any time, please just speak up and do so. Very excited to be launching our first echo virtual rounds on systolic assessing global systolic function. A couple of introductory remarks before we launch um, for the attendings in the room. If you haven't yet completed the survey about your feelings about echo in our faculty among our faculty, please please do so. Um, we're going to have uh, probably a component of bedside sessions like we have for fellows, but we're also going to be having these virtual echo rounds. These will be around one to two times per month. And there'll be a combination of topics like we're doing today and also clip review with fellows or images or clips that anyone brings in. This is just a listing of some of the topics we may or may not or probably will be covering, um, subject to change, of course, and all along the way, feedback and suggestions are always going to be welcome. So to jump right in to the topic of the day, um, assessing LV function. I wanted to share the goal for today will be to learn to interpret POCUS. We're not talking about how to acquire images, that's better done at the bedside, but how to interpret POCUS images to assess a global LV function, not focal, not regional wall motion abnormalities, although that is part of the hidden agenda, which will be to share some broad echo principles that apply regardless of what you're assessing. Um, I'm going to make sure it's, I think it's going to be important to know what other methods are out there for assessing LV function. And there will be a brief dabble into regional wall motion abnormalities just so that we're comfortable with the terminology and what it is used for. And so to hit this, our objectives are to first review the basic echo views with a lens for LV function. And then I'm going to introduce some quantitative methods for assessing LV function, which go a little bit beyond what would be considered basic echo, but that I think are important for developing a nuanced approach to the eyeball method um, for assessing LV function. The under the underline the undercurrent of the title for today's talk is that if you're if you ever hear someone talk about assessing LV function under basic echo, often you'll be told, oh, you just eyeball it and that's it. I mean, we'll talk about how you know just doing that is maybe not so simple, um, but there are ways to to narrow and refine that approach. So to jump right in, why would you ever do POCUS to assess LV function? So you're really only answering a specific question, which is, can reduced systolic function explain a patient's hemodynamic state? That's generally why in the ICU, we're going to be looking at LV function. They're in shock, pressure requirement is going up. Is it because of their heart? If the answer is yes, then ECHO might also help you figure out what's going on. Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, MI, PE. Um, but the first question about what's happening with the LV um, is really just to answer if the systolic function is explaining the patient's hemodynamic state. And this might be upon admission, or it might be that the patient was doing fine in the ICU and then suddenly have some escalating pressure requirement and you're doing a follow-up eval. And it's like anything is like anything with echo, it's one piece of a broader workup. The echo will not always, will often not just give you the answer that you need. Sometimes it will. You see a huge pericardial effusion that often gives you all the thing, all the answers you need, but very often it's just a data point. It's not the only tool in the work in the tool shop, of course. And it's not an outpatient or comprehensive echo. And to that end, it's not as important for you to be able to distinguish moderate from severe dysfunction or mildly reduced from normal. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And it's most helpful for identifying extremes and significant changes. And that the, the extreme, the, the difference between the extremes that you might be able to identify and the changes you might be able to pick up will improve as you refine your approach to assessing LV function. Um, but to begin with, you should be, you know, an, an echo will be able to show you if the heart is not pumping at all or if it's pumping what you think is probably normal. But if you're trying to get a specific EF or you're trying to answer a nuanced question, that's the that's the, what the comprehensive echoes are for. Um, and so don't forget, don't I wouldn't generally use a POCUS echo to to um, obviate the need for a comprehensive echo. So to jump right in, you know, echo echo parameters that measuring anything on an echo often can be done in quantitative or qualitative ways. And in general, basic echo, as opposed to advanced critical care echocardiography, for which there's board certification and other credentialing, basic echo generally is qualitative, which makes it sometimes simpler, sometimes easier, but also makes it a pretty blunt tool. Whereas as you go to you know, advanced echo training, then you're able to start to quantify things. And you can look at specifically the ejection fraction, or you can segment the LV into regions and identify a coronary distribution of regional wall motion abnormality 
or you can take measurements using you know, spectral Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, measure velocities. So the tool is finer um, and is able to answer more questions, but is obviously also more time consuming and requires more expertise. And I would say that having gone through the whole pathway, I still believe that 90 to 95% of what I find echo useful for in the ICU is under subsumed under basic echo. That going all the way for advanced critical care echo is not necessarily um, a critical tool for everyone um, of all interests. So to keep us focused on basic echo, although this talk will kind of go a little bit into what I would call intermediate. You know, echo, as I mentioned, invokes the eyeball method to bucket systolic function, right? So they say, take your echo probe and just go say what you think. Don't tell me a specific DF, just put your probe on and see if you think this is hyperdynamic, normal, mildly reduced, moderately reduced, or severely reduced. And this might seem simple, but I, I think it's not. But one thing that does simplify this, as I alluded to in the very beginning, is that teasing apart normal and hyperdynamic is not crucial. If your patient has a rising pressure requirement and is going to refractory shock, and you look at it and you're like, I'm not sure if this is normal or hyperdynamic, it really doesn't matter because it answers your question that this is probably not cardiogenic shock. Or normal and mildly reduced to the same degree, right? If it's just mild, if you're wondering if maybe this is mildly reduced, that's probably not the cause of your patient's hemodynamic state. Mindful, of course, that if they're on inotropes or anything else that's in the clinical context that might be supporting the heart, then you have to keep that in mind. And similarly, moderate to severely reduced. So you don't really need five buckets so much as you really probably need three, hyperdynamic to normal, moderate to severely reduced, normal to mildly reduced. And so that makes it a little bit easier. But I still think that telling people to eyeball and bucket, um, bucket function based on just how you're looking at it is a deceptive oversimplification. Is a deceptive oversimplification because how do you suddenly become qualified to eyeball? And I think the answer, and that's why I'm going to introduce some quantitative quantitative measures today, is that you have to train your eye to see the quantitative measures without measuring them. So you have to know if you were to quantify different parts, different components of LV function, what would you be quantifying? And then by looking at those things, even maybe without quantifying them or doing it a couple of times just to teach yourself, I think you'll be able to get a much more nuanced approach to assessing LV function. And that might seem a lot right now, but I hope that by the end of this hour, um, it will seem actually quite achievable. And so to jump right in, we're going to review some basic echo views with the lens for LV function. I'm gonna ask um, if any of our fellows are willing to share what view we're looking at right now. See the this is a safe space. Parasternal lung. Thank you, yes, parasternal lung. And I'm not gonna talk about how to get it, um, but can you tell us also how to know, the first thing you have to know whenever you're looking at a basic view is are you even on axis? Before you start making interpretations, is this a good clip? Um, so is anyone able to, any of the fellows also able to share with us how you know that this is on axis? Maybe because you, look you at can- the, oh. Not, uh, Say that again, sorry, cut out. I was just gonna say, this is Helen. Hey, I was gonna say, I look at the aortic outflow tract and the mitral valve and I essentially want them, uh, I wouldn't be able to see both um, with the aortic valve and outflow tract slightly, I guess, to the right of the mitral. Yeah. Yeah, and then also two thirds of the LV without seeing the apex. Exa that's exactly, those are the two things, that's all we have. That's perfect, Helen, thank you. So you're seeing, so for anyone not familiar, left atrium, mitral valve, blood flow goes into the LV, through the aortic valve, out the aortic outflow tract. And over here you have the right ventricular outflow tract. And to know that this is on axis, you need to see both of these valves sort of opening and closing on plane. You see the aortic valve closing very nicely over here. You see the mitral valve opening and closing and you're not seeing an apex, which is important because if you are seeing an apex, you're probably foreshortened and actually seeing lateral walls that are just coming together because you're sort of at an oblique angle. And so the first question you ask yourself is, are we on axis? The answer is yes. So the next question is, what are you seeing? And this delves a little bit into what walls are you seeing? And I guess also part of the same question is, what are you not seeing? This delves a little bit into maybe advanced echo. So I'm just gonna share, not that it's important to memorize, but I think it's important to understand them. And as we were shared over the course of the year, it might become second nature to remember, but this is the anterocephal wall and this is the infralateral wall. And I'm gonna pause briefly to talk about LV wall segments for the same reason, but that's important because you're not seeing other walls. It's important to recognize these do not necessarily represent the entire LV function. So we're knowing that we're on axis by looking at these valves, by not seeing the apex, 
We're identifying the anteroceptal wall and the infralateral wall. And then the last thing to look at are the features of normal LV function. And so the first thing to look at is myocardial thickening. Right? A lot of people just sort of jump to look at what you think the EF is, but look at the muscle walls themselves. Notice how insistently these walls are thickening. You have the septal wall thickening and you have the free wall here thickening. And you might even notice that the free wall thickens actually a lot more than the septal. And they're actually cut off. So you know the free wall should be in the normal circumstances thickening approximately 40%, which isn't important to, mount to, to, to technically me uh, measure, although you can. But it's important to recognize because you might be able to notice if it's not thickening 40%, if it's thickening a little less than 10%, for example. So one of the first things you look at is not the chamber size and how much that's changing, but how well these walls are actually themselves thickening. The next thing is myocardial excursion. You might also notice that the septum and the walls are actually moving on this longitudinal plane over here. The wall and muscles are moving. As they contract inward, the muscle, the LV has interesting 3D geometry. It moves longitudinally, circumferentially at an oblique angle, but that also causes the muscles to move. And if they're not moving up and down nicely also, that might also be a sign of LV dysfunction. And then finally, you look at right, row chamber contraction, maybe that's not the best term, but that's the thing that I think we naturally look for, which is how much do we think this is squeezing out? Almost like trying to eyeball an EF, although you certainly can't do that by just looking at this, which I'll get to soon. And the last thing that I have to say that's true for all of that is you never make a call from one view. So you'll see whatever you think on this view, and then you'll look at the other views, which we're about to go through, and you'll ask yourself, whether or not you know, the things that you've saw, seen on this view are corroborated on the other views, or maybe the different segments that you're not seeing here are behaving differently, which you'll be able to capture on, on other views. So I just wanna actually pause here for a very brief digression, a two slide digression on regional wall motion abnormalities, because you might hear that term used but not realize how specific in uh, terminology those are. So the heart actually has 17 segments. And as we know, the lung has 18, which means that the lungs are still more complex than the heart. The heart has 17 segments, and the way it's divided is like this. So along the longitudinal plane of the heart, there are four le levels, the basal level, the mid-level, the apical level, and the apex itself, which is only one. And each of these levels have a different number of segments. The basal level and mid-level each have six segments. You can see them labeled over here, and they all have names, anterior, anterolateral, infralateral. The mid-level also has six segments. As you get closer to the bottom of the heart, you only have four segments at the apical level, and then the apex itself is the 17th segment. And so every single region of the heart actually has a name, and we're gonna point that out on the next segment. And the reason why I think that's important, um, not only to be able to identify or communicate what it is that you're seeing if you get to that point, um, is also to recognize what I've been stressing, which is that each wall, each view only shows you certain things. The, Apical, the parasitic long axis view that we just showed you is only showing you the basal and mid-level anteroceptal and infralateral wall. You're not seeing you know, 13 other segments. And so it's important to keep that in mind when you're trying to not make a call or to avoid making a call from one view um, about everything else that's going on in the heart. And then the last thing to say is that these segment combinations can of course correlate with coronary anatomy. And so this could be helpful in theory because if you're seeing regional wall motion abnormalities um, that are in a coronary distribution, that might make you much more concerned about an MI. If they're in a non-coronary distribution, that might make you more confident that this is a you know, stress card, sepsis cardiomyopathy or stress cardiomyopathy. But I'll share that this is all in theory. I think in practice, this is a little bit beyond the scope of focus. And this is something that certainly should be, sh should be done by cardiology. Um, but I, so I think it's only important to share this just for the knowledge, just to know what's going on behind the scenes, to be able to maybe over time develop a, an eye for these patterns. But this is definitely well beyond the, the basic excellence. So I'm not going to stress that beyond what I just said. But if anyone has any questions, please, as always, feel free to pipe up at any time. So back to our basic views. We're now, can a fellow please uh, name this view for us? I don't want to call on anybody specifically, but we saw the parasternal long. This is the parasternal short. Parasternal short. And the parasternal short has four levels. So what level are we seeing here? Looks like the level of the papillary. Yeah, papillary, which is which is roughly the mid level that we saw before. The basal level would be sort of the mitral valve. So the mid level, the papillary level, this would be the papillary muscle level. And you can look at LV function at all the levels, but traditionally the papillary muscle, the papillary level is the primary one on this view. And so the question is again, are we on axis? 
And so the way you know you're on axis in this view is a little bit more tricky. So at the papillary level, what you should be able to see is two papillary muscles here. They also have names, posteromedial, anterolateral. We'll just repeat that over time and people will start to get it, but it's also not crucial. Um, they should be both, ba both basically have these little bean shape to them. This one actually might even be slightly off axis. Um, um, but they should have this sort of bean type quality to it. And in general, even in disease at this level, the heart should be pretty circular. If it's looking oval or oblique, then you're, if it's looking oval, um, you're probably at an oblique angle, which is very easy to do. Um, so it's important, again, to before you make any call from a view, recognize if you're off axis or not. Because if you're off axis, you can very easily think that you're seeing regional wall motion abnormalities that are not there. And then moving on, what LV walls are we seeing? Well, this time we're actually seeing a piece of all the walls, but only at one level. So right now we're at the mid level. And I pointed out that there are six segments at the mid level. So you have the septum here. So you'll have above the septum, you have the anterior wall. So all the way at the bottom, you have the inferior wall. And then the septum is divided into anteroseptal and inferoseptal. And then you have anterolateral and inferolateral. So it's kind of intuitive. It all follows that anterior inferior axis. Um, but again, recognize you're not seeing any of these walls at the papillary level, at the, at, the, at the base level, you're not seeing any of these walls at the apical level, you're only seeing these walls at these levels, you're seeing six segments of every, but one piece of every wall. And again, what are the features of normal LV function? They're the same. Look again at the LV wall thickening. Now, don't just jump into the amount of contraction or your presumption of EF, but look at this wall thickening really nicely. Again, the septum not thickening as much as the free wall probably because it's owned by the RV to some extent, and maybe it's just less muscular. Myocardial excursion, harder to see here because the movement of the heart is sort of into and out of the screen. So you're not necessarily going to be able to pick up on the fact that the wall, that the heart is moving, you know, longitudinally. And then again, you can now, you can take a look at chamber contraction and get your sense of how much of this wall, or how much of these walls or how much, what percent of this area is changing. So just to bring this up, and just to say it once and, and not really delve into it either, you, when you're looking at myocardial thickening, at the thickening of the wall, and I mentioned that the free wall should thicken around 40%. And again, strictly speaking, those could be measured, but there are also cutoffs for the terms that are used to describe that. If it's thickening normally, it's called normokinetic. Once it's less than 30%, it's hypokinetic. And once it's less than 10%, it's akinetic. And if it's moving in the wrong direction, then it's dyskinetic. And these are just terms that you can take or leave. Um, they're just another way of communicating what you're seeing at each view. So here's a clip I stole from Ian Rassas, who's a really great um, Twitter cardiology guy. Um, but you can see here, this wall, akinetic. We're in the parasternal short axis again, papillary muscle level. This wall, barely thickening. This wall here, hypokinetic, although you might think that it's thickening quite well. And honestly, I think it's a, it's a, it's a soft call to call this hypokinetic, it could very well be more than 30%, but that's what they labeled it. And here you can see dyskinetic. As the rest of the heart is contracting in, the septum is bowing out. So the septal wall here is being dyskinetic. And so as you train your eye also, you can start to recognize that there are different segments and that this could be divided into six segments. And different segments can be doing different things even in the same view. You could have an akinetic, a hypokinetic, or a normal segment, and a dyskinetic segment as well. Finally, we're at the apical, or not finally, there's gonna be a fourth view that we'll touch on, but we're at the apical four chamber view. And I'll stop putting our fellows on the spot here, um, but to know that you're on axis here. So again, this is left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. You can see both your valves opening and closing nicely. The heart is, the apex is right here at the center of the screen and the heart is coming down almost like this ice cream cone very nicely down the center. So that's an on axis view. And most, this is by convention, how you should see an apical four chamber view. The Mayo Clinic and sometimes in Peds will flip the right and left. And if you're ever, sometimes if you're holding the probe wrong, we might be flipping right and left. And the universal way to know right from left is to see that the tricuspid valve inserts more apically, closer to the apex of the heart than the mitral valve. And that's true across almost all congenital disease and other heart disease. So good fun fact to know. So again, are we on axis? In this view, yes, I can see both valves. I can see that the heart is coming down from the center. The LV, as, as is normal, the apex is occupying. Uh, the LV is occupying the apex of the heart. And what LV walls are we seeing? This time you're seeing inferoseptal at the basal level, the mid-level, 
the septal wall, the apex, and here you're seeing the anterolateral at the base, anterolateral at the mid-level, lateral, and again, septum, uh, uh, apex. And so again, just recognizing that you're seeing, again, a different view of different segments of the heart in the apical four chamber view. And again, you're looking for the same things with one, with one added caveat here. So you're looking at myocardial thickening, the wall thickening nicely. Again, the septum not thickening as much as the superior wall. Myocardial excursion, you're seeing the heart moving, but you also have the annular plane. And for people familiar with TAPSI, and we're gonna be touching on this soon, notice that this is the annulus of the heart and it's moving up and down. Not just the myocardium, but the annulus of the mitral valve. This is the annulus of the tricuspid valve. You see how it's moving up and down nicely. The mitral valve annulus moving up and down. Tricuspid is actually moving a little bit more rigorously as is normal. And so you can also keep an eye on that little mitral annulus and see that it's moving up and down nicely. You're getting good myocardial as well as mitral annular plane excursion. And again, you can see chamber contraction. You can get a sense of the area of the LV that's being ejected. And finally, and I include this mostly for the sake of completion, this is the subcostal view. So you're seeing the left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium. I don't like this view for LV function because it's very difficult to basically get on axis. Again, you're seeing both valves, but it's very, very easy because it's usually body habitus, especially a lot of our patients are intubated, so that makes it more difficult as well. Um, but it's very, very easy to be off axis and to falsely make it seem like your LV chamber is just completely contracting or obliterating even. Um, so I would be very wary of making any calls from this view, but it's sometimes the only view you get. And if you get it on a nice access plane, you can maybe um, make some helpful call, but again, would be very humble about doing anything like that. So I don't think it's generally very helpful for assessing LV function, very helpful for tamponade. It's the best view for tamponade. And obviously there are other things you could see in this view as well. Um, so a helpful view, not so much for us today. So I just wanna pause there in case there are any thoughts or questions before I go into a little bit of a deeper dive in how to refine everything we've been talking about. I don't know if there's been anything in the chat, but if there has been, please speak. I don't think so. Okay, so the next objectives all sort of merge together. And what I'm gonna do is introduce some quantitative measures for assessing LV function, which are strictly beyond you know, basic critical care echo, but I think they're actually very simple to do and will help you train your eye for assessing myocardial excursion, myocardial thickening, the chamber contraction, and that will help you develop an eyeball. And along the way, I'll sort of try to point out some pitfalls and limitations. So your basic quantitative measurements for how the heart is moving has about you know, three categories. You could take one dimensional measurements, linear measurements, which we're gonna kind of emphasize today because they're the simplest to do. 2D measurements where you're looking at fractional area change, I'll go into that. 3D, which we're not going to do, but this is the official gold standard method for assessing ejection fraction, which I'll just share a brief slide on, but obviously is a little bit beyond the scope of what we might do. And then there's beyond that, which is even more advanced sort of spectral Doppler, which I'm not gonna cover at all, but just including here for the sake of completion. So I'm gonna, as I'm gonna go through fractional shorting maps and EPSS. Yeah. These are all things that I think any of us can do, and I'll be happy to, to demonstrate with anyone at the bedside. And I'll show you how I think doing these a few times can be very helpful in helping you develop your eye for LV function. So the first thing is fractional. Sorry, what? My appointment was Sarah at 12 o'clock. So, 12 o'clock. And what you're looking at is the fraction of, so this is kind of a way of training your eye to look at that chamber contraction that I mentioned, which is, what fraction of this LV is contracting, is disappearing basically in systole, or how much is this contracting throughout systole? And so the equation here is left ventricular internal diastolic diameter minus and systolic diameter, diameter. So you're going to be measuring how wide this internal chamber is during diastole, how much less wide it is during systole, and that fraction over the larger dimension is the, is the fractional shortening. So you're getting a percent change in the internal LV width. And you'll get a percent, but that's not ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is volume, right? End diastolic volume minus end systolic volume over end diastolic volume. Here we're getting diameter. So we're getting one dimension, a linear dimension. How much is this internal chamber changing over time? And note that greater than 25% is normal. Less than 20% suddenly is severely impaired, right? There's a pretty, it's a pretty narrow window, but that's how sensitive or helpful this measurement could be when done appropriately. So how do you do it appropriately? 
So you can actually do this in two ways. You can do it on the parasternal long axis view or the parasternal short. So two different views, and I'll show you both. And you could also do it in two dimensions or you could do it using M mode. And I'm gonna use this opportunity to highlight a major limitation of M mode across all uses of echocardiography. So to start, you can take your M mode and the way M mode works for anyone who's not familiar is you put a cursor over the 2D imaging plane that you have here. And once you hit start, what M mode will do is it will plot everything beneath this yellow line here over time. It will ignore everything to the left, everything to the right, and you'll just get a chart here on the bottom, which is plotting this here, this line over time. And so you can see that under this line, you see, you'll be able to be able to see end diastolic diameter and end systolic diameter. It's important to put this line at the mitral valve leaflet tips. So approximately here where I put it right now and don't include the papillary muscles, which shouldn't be here anyway. But if you have papillary muscles, they sort of move into the chamber and they can falsely look like the LV wall and make it look like your contraction is better than it is. So you slap your M mode cursor here, you hit play and you get something that looks like this. And you're plotting this line over time. So during systole, that internal diameter is going to be here and you can measure it easily with calipers on the echo. I will show you how. And then end diastole, the machine will measure for you here. Our machine will even calculate for you the percent change, but I did it for us. So you can see 2.96 centimeters in systole. 4.57 centimeters in diastole. So that gives you a fractional change, fractional shortening of 35%, which would be normal. Except this was one of my early echoes and you could see that I didn't follow my own advice. Look where my M mode cursor was, all the way down here. It should have been over here at the papillary, at the mitral valve leaflet tips. So this invalid, not validated, would have had to be here, although I suspect still would have been normal. So this is how you would use M mode to measure fractional shortening, to measure how much that chamber width changes throughout systole in the parasternal long axis view. So I'm gonna demonstrate how you can do that with the 2D view. And so again, you're looking at this view right here. And instead what you'll do is you'll freeze the echo and it will usually save the preceding you know, 30 seconds or so. So you can go back and take measurements at different screenshots. So for example, I'm gonna pause the video right here. Oops. That job right here. If you were to pause the video here, you could then very easily on the echo just measure this distance for you. And that will be your LV internal diastolic diameter, also called LV end diastolic diameter. Now, one thing I want to point out, and this gets at my point earlier about the limitation with M mode, look at where I'm measuring. This is sort of where the anteroseptum is bowing out. And I'm going out here to the infralateral wall as well. But look at what happens to the septum during systole. Watch. Keep your eye right here on this Boeing septum. I'm gonna let the video play. Look where it moves, right? Because not only is there myocardial thickening, but as I mentioned, there's myocardial excursion, right? So during diastole, during end diastole, your septum, which was previously here, is now here. And the correct way to measure would be here. This would be your LV internal systolic diameter. And using this, you can actually get uh, a fractional shortening a, a fractional shortening or a, a fractional shortening percent, right? But notice that if I did M mode, right, M mode would have still been measuring right here. So I would have not really been getting my internal systolic diameter. I probably would have been somewhat in my LVOT still and my left ventricular outflow tract. This is a major limitation of M mode whenever you're measuring a component of the heart that moves throughout the, throughout the cardiac cycle because the M mode doesn't move, but the heart does move. And you're actually not measuring one spot as you might think you are. Um, so this is why actually for fractional shortening or for many times that people are using M mode, like in the IBC, um, it's actually better to use 2D and actually freeze. Um, and again, this might seem like a lot, but if I show you how to do it once or twice, the entire point of this lecture is by showing that by doing this a few times, you can get a sense yourself of what a normal fractional shortening is so that after a few times, you don't even have to go ahead and measure it. You've just trained your eye to do it yourself. So you could do fractional shortening on the two, as I mentioned, on the parasternal short axis as well. And in this axis, I actually think that 2D and M mode are kind of equivalent um, because the myocardial excursion, as I mentioned earlier, is into and out of the plane. So if you put your M mode straight down the middle, that's really no different. And then you'll get the same idea of the LV end diastolic diameter. You can measure the LV end systolic diameter. You'll again get fractional shortening. You'll be able to take that 
percent change over the LVN diastolic diameter. And again, greater than 25% is normal, less than 20% abnormal. And you can see that if you're not capturing the, if you're on axis, you're not capturing the capillary muscles here on the sides, but you're going through them from front to back. In this view, M mode is probably equivalent to 2D as if you would have frozen it and taken two measurements. Any questions about fractional shortening or complaints or thoughts? Okay, so I'm gonna move on to MAPSI. MAPSI, if you've heard of TAPSI, this is just MAPSI on the other side. And yes, it is a thing and no, it's almost never done. Um, but the reason I'm sharing it again is because not that is again to just completely re reiterate, not so that people should go measuring MAPSI on everyone, but that so that you should be able to do it enough time to train your eye to see it without measuring. So I mentioned how this annulus is moving up and down longitudinally up and down. The RV has a much more dominant longitudinal motion to its contraction than the LV. And so a normal TAPSI is actually higher than a normal MAPSI. But what we want to do is we want to measure the distance that this mitral annulus is moving up and down in systole, right? And in men, if it should move more than 11, in women, if it moves more than 13 millimeters, 1.3 centimeters, that correlates with an EF of greater than 55%. So how do you measure it? If you did the 2D version where you sort of froze and froze, you might find it very difficult because this annulus is quite plump. And it will be hard to like pinpoint the same spot in the annulus here and the same spot in the annulus here and measure that distance. So this is actually one of those places where you need M mode and you slap your M mode cursor over that mitral annulus. And even though you're actually not on the plane that, you know, the mitral annulus is kind of moving in this plane and the M mode cursor is kind of coming off at a little bit of an oblique angle, this is an on-axis image. So MAPSIs and TAPSIs have been validated to be measuring at this somewhat oblique angle. So in fact, if you were off axis, you might falsely increase your maps you read, if that makes any sense. Similarly, if you're off axis in this direction, you'll decrease your maps. Read. But you put an M mode cursor on this mitral annulus, and if you plot this over time, you'll get something that looks like this, where this is your annulus is down in the end of diastole, and then moves up in systole towards the apex, moves back down, moves back up. And if you just measure that distance, that will give you your MAPC and it's that simple. And it's actually quite easy to do as well. And the machine will help you do it too. So you put your M mode cursor over the annulus and the M mode is going to plot this movement over time. So over time it's up and then it's down and then it's up and then it's down and then it's up and it's down. So you see that here, it's up and down and you're gonna measure that distance. That is your MAPC, that simple. Any questions or thoughts about MAPC? So you might be getting a sense how, you know, people eyeball with qualitative echo, you eyeball myocardial thickening, you eyeball myocardial excursion. Well, you can, one way to quantify some degree of myocardial excursion is to look at annular excursion with a MAPC. You eyeball chamber contraction, but one way to measure that is through fractional shortening, and it's pretty reproducible. One major limitation of MAPC and any of these linear dimensional measures is about to be right here. So actually, let me just pause here and ask any brave soul. This is a partial view of a really poorly visual apical portrait. Oh, thank you. Well, thank would, someone, you. would someone would someone be willing to comment on oh, this? What you see here? What's the fractional to... shortening? I'm a spoon and... Again, without measuring it, right? Because we actually can't measure fractional shortening. You don't measure fractional shortening, but just understanding the concept of fractional shortening. What do you think your fractional shortening is? And what do you think your MAPC is on this clip? Any brave souls? I've got 21 minutes to wait. Hey, Jonah, I think um, I would say that the fractional shortening would be um, would show a, a severely impaired EF, where the MAPSI uh, might show a normal EF because I don't see a lot of movement um, in the annulus, at least. Yeah, thank you so much, Omar, for being the brave soul for today, right? So it's, it's really hard. This is a terrible clip, right? And sometimes it's, it's very representative of what we might get in the ICU. I think, you know, the annulus here, you can argue, is moving. You know, it's hard to see, but it seems like there is some excursion here. 
And if you look at the walls here, it's hard to know how much of this is shadowing an artifact and how much of this is real, but it could look like here, at least the wall is thickening. And if you were to ask me, I would say that this chamber is shortening over, you know, 25%. That, you know, that if you looked at and diastole and systole, right? And what happens if you get the full view is this, right? The base is actually kind of functioning pretty well. This is a patient with Takatsubo. And clearly you can see that this is not normal. And so this is, I think, important to highlight several important points. The first is to take MAPSI and try to make a claim about global LV function is a stretch. Unless, and I think this is the crucial point, unless when you're, you're able to visualize the entire heart and you see homogenous function, whether it's good or bad, impaired or normal, if it's homogenous, then you can tell me that this MAPSI, whether it's high or low, represents global LV function. But when you see an echo like this, and you tell me the MAPSI is normal, that is the wrong thing to say, right? Because clearly it's not representing the rest of the heart. Same with fractional shortening. So if you don't, and very often, you know, you can only get a partial view, a patient has rib shadows and is obese, and you're not even getting a full view, and people might see something like this and say, look, I couldn't get a great view, but you know, it looked normal to me. That's, that could be extremely dangerous um, because people might hang on that. And you have to recognize how much you might not be seeing. Really important to be measured and humble in your calls when you have poor windows. So this highlights the limitations of a linear measurement, of a one of a one-dimensional measurement to tell me global 3D function, making calls of one view, and also the limitation of making calls from an impaired view. Uh, they will here. come get you yeah, soon, okay. <laughs> same thing here. This is a similar patient with Takatsuba, who we actually, this one is one of mine. And here you can see that the base, not moving great actually but moving a lot better than here. And you can make a false call if you measure your fractional shortening here, or if you try to do a MAPC in the apical four, right? you can be steered wrong. So really important to recognize all that you're not seeing um, and the major limitations of these one-dimensional measures. The last one-dimensional measure I'm gonna mention is EPSS endpoint or E-point septal separation. So this is saying that you should look at this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and it should come close to this septum within seven millimeters. And if it doesn't get that close, then you have diastolic severe dysfunction, probably, or maybe. Sensitive, but really a nonspecific, right? So you're measuring the smallest distance from the tip of the anterior mitral valve leaflet to the septum. So I tried to measure for us here. So this is the closest that the anterior leaflet gets to the septum. You measure this and it's five millimeters. Great, it's normal, right? Um, if it's greater than seven millimeters, abnormal, sensitive for LV function, dysfunction, but not specific. You can imagine if a patient has severe aortic insufficiency, AR, that will push this valve down even if the heart has very normal function. So a lot of limitations uh, or some limitations to using EPSS to talk about systolic function. But again, homogenous, if, you, if, it's, if it's representative of what you think is looking elsewhere, then it's more helpful. If you're, I guess you're another way of saying that is if your pretest probability is high, then it's also going to be more helpful. You can also do this with M mode. Instead of freezing and measuring like I just showed you, you can put an M mode on. And again, you'll see that the mitral valve on M mode does this funny thing where it bounces up once. There's an E point and an A point. The E point is from the mitral valve moving towards the septum as the initial bolus of blood comes from the atrium into the ventricle. Then it sort of slows down and then the atria contracts. So there's another little bump and you have an A wave, an atrial kick correlates with the A wave that you see on your CVP tracings, so the same A wave, but we're looking at the E point septal separation. So it's called EPSS because it make, because on M mode, it makes an E point and you get the minimum distance between the E point and the septum. And you're able to measure whether or not it's more or less than seven millimeters. And that's all I have to say about our one dimensional measurements, fractional shortening and EPSS and MAPSI. Um, I'm going to go through the rest of these very quickly because I don't think they're as helpful, but just to recognize that they're there. So instead of one dimension, you could do two dimensions. Instead of looking at linear change or fractional shortening, you could look at fractional area change. So same idea. It's best done. It's only done in the parasitical short axis, but basically you get the percent change in the LV area. Area is pi r squared. So you just need to get the circle there or on some machines, you're able to literally trace. So it doesn't have to be a purple, perfect circle and 35 to 65% is normal. Again, not an ejection fraction. So a fractional area change of 
is normal. And so the way you would do that is you would pause in both your end diastolic area and diastole and systole. You draw a circle around both and the machine will calculate for you the area. You might not have to draw a circle again on some machines you can physically draw and notice that you don't include papillary muscles. That's a common theme whenever you're doing quantitative measures on the LV. The papillary muscles, sure, they might obstruct a large percentage of your view here, but they're a three-dimensional structure that don't occupy a meaningful space within the LV, so we ignore them. Because if you count them, you'll certainly overestimate the amount of change in the, in the LV chamber. So in theory, this is how you would do a fractional area change, but I think in practice, not so helpful for us. And finally, the gold standard of how ejection fraction is mentioned is measured, and I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Um, and, uh, and if it makes sense, that's wonderful. And if not, I'll be happy to explain in more detail another point, another time. But if you go into your apical four chamber view, you're able to pause the machine again during systole and diastole. And you can trace at end diastole, you trace around the LV, again, leaving the papillary muscles inside. And then you make a flat line at the, at the annulus, at the level of the mitral valve. And you do the same in diastole. And so this would be enough to get you, you know, fractional area change. But what we do in the Simpson's biplane method is you now you rotate the probe 90 degrees and you go into your apical two chamber view. And what you're doing here is sort of you're coring the apple at the other dimension. So this is let's say you know north and north to south. Now you're getting east to west. And so by getting that at a 90 degree angle and doing this again, then at each level the machine is able to create some fake disc. That something looks like it looks something like this, and I know this is a lot, which is why I hesitate to bring it in, but I think it's a helpful thing to share. And again, if it doesn't make sense, I can explain it better in more time um, off off the record. But you basically you have your end diastolic view in the apical two chamber view and the apical four chamber view, and by doing that, you're getting these you're getting the one dimension this way and one dimension this way, and you're getting the change. So it's able to calculate the volume of all the theoretical discs that would occupy all this space and then diastole, and then systole, and literally calculate, finally, an ejection fraction because you're actually getting volume. Hope that makes sense. If not, it's fine because this isn't something that anyone would actually do, I think, bedside in POCUS. But it's not as important to get your exact EF. This is something that echocardiographers can do, not something that's so important for us, but important to recognize this is EF. Nothing else that we've talked about is ejection fraction. Um, so I actually pointed out a lot of the pitfalls and limitations already. What I'm going to do now is just share a few cases, and I might pick on some fellows if, if that's okay, um, to sort of just share your thoughts. And, uh, and with that, we'll close and take any questions. So case number one, any, any brave fellows willing to speak about what you see? Oh, I already gave the answer at the bottom there. I shouldn't have. Maybe it's gone if nobody saw it. But that's not really the point. What do you what view do we have here? Lone axis. Yeah, partial lung axis. Thanks, Danielle. And what do you think? What are you seeing? What are you looking at? Um, so I am just looking at the the valves. I can see um kind of like in terms of like the ratio between the RV, the um outlet track of the um uh atrial and then uh and mitral and aortic uh and then i can see the lv and i don't see the the apex so i think it's a good quality for that case awesome. um and then looking at kind of like how much uh contract um yeah like to me like i already saw the answer but i will have say based on the first one the like I thought it was normal on the first one. Like if I look at the second one, like the the four chambers, it probably look not normal. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's what I was thinking. That's great, thank you. Yeah, so you might look at this and actually wonder about the perhaps wonder about you know the the fractional shortening here again without even measuring it by just like eyeballing. Do we think that's contracting more than twenty five percent? And maybe I don't know. But you can also look at the septum and see, is it thickening so much or the free wall? Not really, right? Not thickening very much. Is the muscle moving rigorously? Maybe, not so sure. I don't, it depends, like, a little subjectivity to it, right? But you're not, definitely not seeing a lot of myocardial thickening here. 
overall, it doesn't seem like it's very rigorous, but you can be fooled in bradycardic hearts and think that slow means poor function, which is obviously not the case. And then you slide over here and you're in your, or here you go to your parasitical short axis view. And again, you're again, seeing not a lot of chamber contraction, not a lot of change, not a lot of myocardial thickening, maybe some infusion here. And then you go to your apical four chamber and you're again able to see a lot of the same corroborating that the walls are not thickening very much. The chamber contraction, maybe you haven't yet developed an eye for whether or not that's normal or not, but you're seeing that the mitral valve annulus, even if you're not measuring a MAPSI, barely moving, moving, but not rigorously. And here we have a parasternal, a subcostal four chamber. And again, there's some movement. It's not nothing. Um, a lot of people might be tempted to call this severely dysfunctional. I would be too. You know, and, and it's technically moderate, and they only know this because this is a formal, I only know this because this is a formal MGH echo, and the EF was 43% or something like that, and technically below 40 or below 30 would have to be um, severely reduced. So there are cutoffs, but again, that doesn't matter because whether it's moderate or severely reduced, you have your answer if you think that this is clinically significant, which is a good opportunity to mention that, you know, if this is, it's very important in interpreting any LV function, obviously like any other imaging technique, to know the baseline. So a patient could have underlying reduced EF and coming in in shock, and this could be their normal heart, right? So if you have a baseline where yesterday they were pumping away at 60 and an EF 60, and they have no history of heart failure, and you're seeing this, this is your answer. If you don't know this patient, you might have to wonder if maybe this isn't your answer, um, or if the patients always look like this. Um, but I don't think it really matters if you call this moderate or severely reduced. And by eyeball, I think people can give you both ways, but we'll show you severely reduced and you'll see a significant difference, I think. Um, moving on, case number two. Can I pick on one of our fellows again? Any grave souls? Looking for someone I've scanned with recently. Can't find anyone right now. Alnaro, can I pick on you? Yeah, um, so we have on the left side, we have a parasternal long axis as well. Um, the image isn't great because um, we're not seeing much of the LV, uh, maybe about a third of the LV we're pretty much seeing. Um, but from that view, you're able to see some myocardial thickening uh, with systole. Um, able to see as well uh, some myocardial excursion and um, the anterior mitral valve leaflet seems to be almost touching the wall of the septum. So I would say that the patient does have a pretty good EF from the left, but again, I'm not seeing the uh, apex of that left ventricle. Usually we don't see the apex of the left ventricle with you know, in a um, long axis view. Um, and then the, the short axis view on the right, um, we're at the, it seems to be almost papillary level, um, maybe a little bit more towards the apices a bit, but there we're seeing um, myocardial excursion as well as um, uh, myocardial thickening on systole. So I would say the patient does have pretty normal EF. I don't see any hypokinesis of any of the regions either. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. That was great. You might even say the fractional area change here is almost 100%. Although you have yeah. to be careful if you're going below the papillary level towards the apex, because at the apex, even under normal circumstances, you know, it's just the apex. So you might just be seeing the apex coming up, which is always going to look closed. Um, but yeah, this is actually right. This this these, this heart is, is is pumping really well, and in fact, you might even call it hyperdynamic, with the endpoint septum, the the anterior leaflet maybe even touching the septum. If you're getting complete fractional area change, um, like 100%, like I'm saying, I would want to see the other views too. But this is probably going to be a reassuringly normal or hyperdynamic heart, right? And this could be a high cardiac output state. That that could be cirrhosis, sepsis, could also be hypovolemia right? Maybe not hyperdynamic, but maybe just volume down. And that's going to be a topic for another day, which we will cover. Um, but uh, assessing or teasing apart, you know, hypovolemia and hyperdynamic. Um, but uh, exactly, this is all, those are all the features that you would look at on these views to see a normal, to look, to assess LV function.
in the interest of time, I'll just um, walk us through the, the, the remaining cases. So probably don't need to be an echocardiographer to notice that this is bad, right? And you're seeing almost nothing, no thickening here, barely moving anterior mitral valve leaflet here, certainly more than seven millimeters. The fractional shortening is gonna be terrible here. Same idea here, no fractioning, no fraction, no thickening, no movement, barely any budging of the mitral valve. Again, what's over here, you might even pick up that there's like a small LV thrombus, although it's hard to, those can be confused with the trabecula of the heart. So we'd be careful calling that early on, maybe something to get a formal echo for. Severely reduced LV function with a thrombus here. Two more cases to just briefly touch on. This here again, you're seeing thickening, a lot of thickening, looks like more than 40%. This anterior leaflet looks like it's going up towards the base, towards the septum. This is an on-axis image with both your valves. Parasternal short here, thickening nicely, round, on-axis, you're getting these bean-shaped papillary muscles closing nicely. Mitral annulus moving up and down really nicely. This is a normal heart. Not hyperdynamic, not hypodynamic, normal. And then this final case um, is, I'm gonna go through one by one here. So this is, you're actually at the base of the heart here and you're looking at the apex. So you might look at this and say, oh, this is hyperdynamic because it's completely closing. But as I was saying earlier, this is actually what a normal apex would look like. So you can't really make a call. Then you go to this view and the parasternal long axis view and some things are abnormal here, right? You're on axis, you're able to see both your valves, your, your, your apex is off axis, your myocardium not thickening very well, right? Your anterior leaflet moving pretty well, myocardium not thickening very well, fractional shortening is probably low. But I just wanted to highlight that, you know, so here's your, sorry, parasternal short axis. It's a little bit oval, a little bit off axis, but also not moving very well. But then you go to your subcostal and suddenly you have a pericardial effusion. And you have to ask yourself whether or not this is hemodynamically relevant or not. This is all a real echo that we took in January. And then if you move on in the same echo and you get your apical four chamber view and the valve is moving, the annulus not so much, maybe there's some thickening here, not so great. You see your, you get a whiff of your tricuspid valve that's moving quite nicely here. And then you put on some color and you notice that there is MR maybe. And is that significant? Well, it might not seem significant to you um, on this view, but mitral valve, mitral MR can be very much under uh, undersold or, or underappreciated on the parasternal long axis view for several reasons. Um, and then over here, you put some color on the aortic valve and there's a lot of AI or a little bit of AI or how do you quantify that? Another topic for another time. But my point is, that my point in sharing this echo is not for anyone to make a call about LV function, but to remember not to get caught up in your LV function and forget to look at everything else. Don't forget to look at your subcostal view and identify a possible pericardial effusion. Don't forget to put on your color and realize that the patient could have AI or MR or valvular pathology. Right? This is an LV systolic function focused talk, but your patient who's hemodynamically unstable, of course, can have any of several concomitant or different etiologies of, the, of their hemodynamic troubles at any given moment. Um, so, Final thoughts here, echo does not substitute your clinical thinking and management. Of course, it has to be interpreted in the context of your patient. Are they on inotropes or pressors? What was their previous function? How does this differ, as I mentioned? And remember that it's difficult to interpret if you don't know their priors. Remember that reduced EF, and this is extremely important, which I didn't delve into today, will be a topic of a future talk, but reduced EF does not mean reduced cardiac output. So basically, in compensated dilated cardiomyopathy, you might have a dilated heart, poor systolic function, very high EPSS, and a normal cardiac output because it's compensated, right? Whereas you can have a heart that it looks like it's hyperdynamic and looks like its EF is 100% and your stroke volume could be 10 cc's. Um, remember, to sum summary of the, the eyeball approach now is to make sure that you check all your views, parasitic long axis, short axis, apical four, look at the subcostal two, even though for LV function itself, I think it's not gonna be so helpful. Also note the thickening, the excursion, the change in chamber size. And if you can pick up the tools to actually measure an EPSS or a fractional shortening or a MAPSI, I think doing them several times will really help refine your approach, train your eye, so that in the future you don't have to measure them as much. Always keep in mind the clinical status of the patient. And some of the pitfalls that we mentioned, or I didn't mention, that tachycardia can make the heart EF look a little bit better 
I mentioned bradycardia can make you think that it's worse um, than it is. Tachycardia can make it look better than it is. Cylinder effect is just another way of saying, make sure that you're always on axis. Regional wall motion abnormalities are something to keep an eye out for. Endocardial dropout is again, the comment that I was making about how sometimes you just won't be able to, if, if you're if they're shadowing and you're not able to see a wall well, resist the temptation to make a call. Papillary muscle can be confused for LV wall. And another talk for the future that will cover a lot of this is gonna be our talk on measuring cardiac output. Um, I'm gonna skip the 10 commandments, which I think I've covered already and ready to take any questions for anyone who doesn't have to jump off. And thank you. Joan, a quick question. On case four, was there an RV inversion on that? Or, because the RV has looked very collapsible there, but maybe I have to go back. Case four. I was just looking at the LV, I don't remember. So here's case four. On your, um, oh wait, uh, sorry, case four, the next one, yeah. Um, on that subcostal view, I think it is down there. Uh, yeah. So the this, bottom. Yes, yeah, so what's your question? Oh, I was just wondering if there was RV inversion there or it's that just the view. Yeah, so this is actually a perfect representation of why I don't think the subcostal view is good for EF. Yeah. Because if you're just like, this patient is breathing, so you can see that the echo itself just, just now, it grew and it changes over time. Yep. yep. It's very hard to be on axis. You could very easily call that like 100% EF of the RV, right? Or fractional shortening. And it's really just a right. function of where right. it is. And I wouldn't, and we'll have an RV talk maybe next week yeah. even already. Um, but this is, this view for RV function is actually good for getting RV free wall thickness because that's measured well over here. But anything else as far as RV function, really tough to make a call from the subcostal view. Seeing... Awesome, thank you. This whole thing was amazing. <laughs> thank you, sure, happy. Happy to stay on as long as anyone who has questions have questions. I'm not running anywhere, but understand if anyone needs to, it's 102. You're all very welcome, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. Thank you all so much for coming.